there we go. Success. Good to see everybody this evening. Hope you all had a good week. We looked at chapter 10. You're going to have to have your Bibles tonight because I didn't load. I forgot to load chapter 11 PowerPoint. I thought they were together, but they're not. So we're in chapter 11 tonight, which is a recap of 10. Basically, it's Peter going back in and explaining what happened to the Jews. And I think it's fascinating as you look at their response. We talked about prejudice quite a bit last time we had class. And the idea of the prejudice that existed between the Jews and the Gentiles. We talk a lot about prejudice today, don't we? And we talked a lot about, you know, how do we fight? How do you combat that, being prejudiced? Because generally to be prejudiced is against a group of people or a certain demographic of people. And prejudice in the world runs a lot of different ways, doesn't it? It's not always color. It's not always race. It's not always speech. It's not always anything. Sometimes it can be some of those things or maybe none of those things. So it's kind of interesting, isn't it? You know, Hitler, he was prejudiced, wasn't he, against, we like to say Jews, but that really isn't accurate, is it? He was prejudiced against somatic speakers, and that encompasses a lot of different individuals in the world. He also persecuted gypsies, didn't he? He also persecuted the disabled, the mentally ill, the elderly. So there was a lot of things you could say, well, in a way, he was prejudiced against that. So, in our country, we've talked a lot about that. Um, you know, are we prejudiced or not prejudiced? Or how does that play out? And how do we make people not be prejudiced? Well, that's very difficult, isn't it? Government spent a lot of money trying to make people get past being prejudiced. And like I said last week, if you're old enough, you probably remember busing, the great failure of the world, right? We're going to bus kids all over the place, and we're going to make schools interracial because we're going to try to combat prejudice. And all we wound up doing was throwing kids on buses for hours and hours, and we really didn't accomplish a single thing because that's not how we, not necessarily how we stop that. Peter faces the same problem. Peter was prejudiced against the Gentiles, wasn't he? He didn't want to go. He didn't want to go to Cornelius. Didn't want to go into his house. He wouldn't have if he hadn't had his vision from God that said, you need to go do it. He had no desire to take the gospel to the Gentiles. It wasn't Peter's initiative. Peter didn't go to God and say, God, maybe we ought to share the gospel with the Gentiles. Peter never did that. God had to go to Peter and say, Peter, you need to go share the gospel with the Gentiles. Peter was opposed to that, obviously, because he had prejudice, right? He was raised to he was raised that Gentiles were unclean. He was raised that Gentiles were beneath the Jews. Um, you couldn't just flip a switch and say, okay, well, that's okay now, because that's not how that works, right? Um, so Peter faced two problems with Cornelius. One problem is Peter had his own prejudice against Cornelius, not wanting to go. God overcame that with a vision that he sent to Peter, and Peter had a visual demonstration that God accepted them by pouring out of the Holy Spirit. Peter baptized them. But the truth is, Peter still was a prejudiced individual. We know that because later on, when we get further into Acts, Peter and Paul are going to both be in Antioch, and Peter is going to associate with the Jews and not the Gentiles, and Paul is going to as he relates in his letters, Paul says, I confronted him to his face and said, you're wrong because you're associating with the Jews and not the Gentiles. So just because Peter had this vision and had this revelation and went to Cornelius, the Bible plays out that Peter didn't necessarily embrace the Gentiles. So the other problem Peter has is now Peter has to convince the Jews in Jerusalem that, okay, the Gentiles are all right. This isn't going to be easy. Am I right? This is not going to be easy. So Peter goes back to Jerusalem. And in Acts chapter 11, Peter is going to go back to Jerusalem. He's going to try to convince the Jews that the Gentiles uh, have the gospel. You know, when we get to this point in Acts, 
we're 10 or 11 years in here. You got to remember the church was extremely Jewish up until this point. There were no, now I, I, I guess we had to be careful to say no Gentile converts, but we didn't have any recorded Gentile converts. Now we had, if you look at Acts 7, we had the Grecian widows and the Hebrew widows, but there's no indication those were both Jewish. So there's no indication that we're talking about Gentiles. When we're talking about the Greeks in Acts 7, we're really talking probably about Jewish. So we're, the church was extremely Jewish. So now how are we going to change that? Well, God's going to open it up to Cornelius. Peter goes back in Acts 11. Peter's got to go back. And I think it's interesting, uh, you know, Peter's take on it. And then as Peter has to go back and explain to it, uh, they heard the Gentiles had also received the word, Acts 11. When Peter came to Jerusalem, those who were circumcised took issue with him. You went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. So right there is the beginning of the problem, right? Uncircumcised, Gentiles. Difference between Jews and Gentiles. Paul's going to fight this, right? Paul's going to circumcise Timothy but refuse to circumcise Titus. So Paul is going to fight this same idea. So are they prejudiced because they're not circumcised? Or is the non-circumcision just saying they're prejudiced because they're Gentiles? Probably both. But the other thing is, they're Gentiles, right? Because if you proselyted into Judaism, you'd be circumcised. So this tells you they are Gentiles. And he says here, but Peter explained. I was in the city of Joppa. So he goes through, we've heard this, there's no sense to be reading it. So he goes through what God did. God gave him the vision. Clean and unclean. Get up and eat. Kill and eat. No, Lord, I've never read anything unclean. What I say is clean is clean. So this happened three times, right? And the men appeared at the house, down to Acts 11, and verse 12, the Spirit told me to go with them. But then he adds in 12, six brethren also went with me. Now we don't get that in, in 10, because he's making a case. And the best way you can make a case is to say, I have witnesses. So when he gets to 11, he's saying, listen, I have witnesses. Six people went with me. Now he doesn't just say six people went, does he? He says six brethren went with me. So we're going to assume these would be Jewish Christians, right? I guess, can we say that? I guess we have to say that, right? Jewish Christians. So these six brethren went with him and they entered it. And he reported about the angel. And I think 14, right, we're kind of getting where we were last time we had class, week four last. I, I say 14 is a verse you ought to have underlined in your Bible. He will speak words to you by which you will be saved, you and all your household. And I think that's really important. He didn't say the Holy Spirit was going to save him. He didn't say the pouring out of the Spirit was going to save him. He didn't say he's going to come and give you the Spirit to save you. That's not what he said. He says he's going to give you words by which you must be saved. Words, knowledge of salvation. And so he says it here. And he says, um, and as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them, just as it did at us at the beginning. So this is, Peter's making an exception here. He's not saying this is what happens. This is the normal, okay? He says, this happened to us at the beginning. He doesn't say, oh, this is what happens to us all the time. This is what happens to us every day. This is what happens every time somebody's saved. That's not what he says. He says, okay, there's two times this happened. At the beginning, Pentecost, and now. This isn't a common event. This isn't going to happen every day. This isn't going to happen every time somebody's converted. This isn't the way people are converted. This is the, auth this is the authentic, the, huh, think of the word in a minute. This is kind of the seal of God. This is the authentication. That's the word I'm looking for. This is the authentication of God that I, I accept these Gentiles. And Peter makes it clear that this isn't normal at the beginning. Now, if it had happened every time somebody was saved, if it had happened several times in the life of Peter, then Peter would have said, the Holy Spirit fell on them as it falls on us. Didn't say that. He says it did it like it happened at Pentecost. 
So Pentecost, Cornelius, those are unique in the Bible. Not another recording of anything like that happening again. Pentecost, Cornelius. Not common, not happening every time. Peter says, here and here. This is when this happens, here and here. And so he says, and so he says, uh, the Holy Spirit fell as did us beginning. And I remembered how the word of the Lord, how he used to say, John baptized the water, but you be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Therefore, if God gave to them the same gift as he gave to us, after believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? When they heard this, they quieted down, glorified God. Well, God has granted the Gentiles the repentance that leads them to life. Now, it seems pretty simple. But is it? No. Because it's not that simple. Because all the first part or the earliest writings of the Bible are all about one thing. Judaizers and Gentiles. Judaizers, Judaizers, and Gentiles. It's not going to be long, Acts 13, we're going to have the church at Antioch. First Gentile church, Antioch. Called Christians first at Antioch. When we have the church in Antioch, right before that, right before that, what do we have? Jerusalem Council. Because they said, you need to make those Gentiles be circumcised. We ain't gained any ground. You see what I'm saying? So we go, they go to Jerusalem, and they said, well, just command them to abstain from sexual immorality and abstain from blood. Compromise. Right? Compromise. We ain't gaining any ground. So we go through Romans, and we go through almost all of Paul's letters, and we go through James, which James is early. We go through all these things, and it's repeated over and over and over. Judaizers, Jews and Gentiles, circumcision, non-circumcision. Non we beat it to death because it's going to be a problem from now on. So the question you kind of got to ask yourself here is why? Why was it such a big deal to Jews. Why couldn't they just say, okay, we're all Christians now, right? We're all the same. We're all baptized into Christ. We're all the same. We need to let it go. We need to get along. We need to quit trying to make them be Jewish because isn't that what they wanted to do? They wanted to make them Jewish, didn't they? Be circumcised, keep the, keep the Passover, keep the Sabbath, and be a Christian. Am I right? But guess what? God said, I did away with that. You don't have to do that anymore. Why do we have, why couldn't they let it go? And where does that leave the Gentiles in the early church, do you think? If you're a Gentile in the early church, and there's Jews, which are going to be in your church, how do you think that works out for you? <laughs> it's not good, is it? <laughs> right. And the truth is, this still exists today. This still exists today with Messianic Judaism. Still exists. To, it's, still, it's, still, it's still in the world. It still exists. It exists right now in the world. There's Jewish, Messianic Jews, that's what we call them, right? Messianic Jews today who would say to you, you need to keep the Passover. You need to, you need to keep the Sabbath. You need to worship on Saturday. Still exists. At least centuries later, still exists. So it's hard to let go. It's hard to... It's hard to move to a place where we're all just Christians, it seems like, instead of being designated. What happens in the Bible, right? If you look at Cor the Corinthians, you look at the church in Corinth, Paul said, some of you say I'm Paul, some of you say I'm Apollos, right? He says, I thank God that I baptized none of you except these few. We always seem to have these divisions, and that's something we shouldn't have. We should just be Christians. But this prejudice is going to continue throughout the early church. It's going to get better when Jerusalem's destroyed in 71 AD by the Romans. It's going to get better. 
Because if you read late writings, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Gospel of John, Revelation, Judaism, Judaizers, I should say, doesn't really exist in those writings because we're past it by then. The Jerusalem's been destroyed, the Jewish influence has waned. We have different problems now. We have Gnostics, but we don't have Judaizers anymore. And that's why we see a shift in those writings. John isn't writing to you about Jewish Christians. John's writing to you about Gnostics. Paul, on the other hand, Peter, James, they're writing to you about Judaizers. So this is a problem that's going to stay in the church for a long time. But now, as Luke moves us through Acts, he changes gears, and he begins to talk about the church at Antioch. Now, Antioch's going to be such an important church. And I think that's why Luke introduces us to us here early. Because that's where all of Paul's missionary journeys are going to start, is Antioch. So I think he's introducing it here. And it's also, we consider it the first Gentile church. Now, there's still Jews there, we know that, because we're going to get into that and we can do the Jerusalem Council. There's still synagogues, there's still Jews in all these places where there's churches. So that kind of brings up, so where do you think they met? The church in Antioch, or the church, even if we get into later on, into Asia Minor, uh, Ephesus, and other places. Um, when Paul would go into a town, where would he generally go to, to talk to people? Go to synagogue, wouldn't he? So even though you have this Christian movement the way, and you have Judaism, so you kind of, so how does this work, right? Where are they meeting? Who are they associating with? Uh, you know, we say, well, there were house churches, and I'm sure there were house churches. But also, I would contend they might have met in these synagogues, too, also. And if that's the case, you had a really big Jewish influence in these synagogues, regardless of what part of the world you were in, because these synagogues existed in almost every, well, probably did exist, I think we could safely say that, in every town that we had an early church when Paul would travel. Well, you know, if you read some of Paul's writings, you know, he said, you know, he was associated, then he eventually he withdrew from that, but it kind of gives you the idea they were, to an extent, they were meeting in those synagogues to a point. And I mean, you know, where are they going to meet, right? Where there's a place, where it's worship, where they're used to, where they're, you know, I, I mean, I don't know. I'm not saying that existed all the time. I think they used the building. Yeah, I don't necessarily know that they turned, changed the synagogue into a Christian church, but I mean, I think that's where they went to talk. That's where they went to debate. That's where they went to teach. Some, yeah, but I think as you move into Asia, maybe in other places, maybe more so. I don't know. But I know Paul did. You know, he, he gives you that indication. And eventually he says, I withdrew from the Jews, right? I mean, Paul makes that statement. I withdrew from them because, you know, basically I wasn't gaining any ground, but it kind of gives you the idea of that intermingling between uh, Jews and Christians. Yeah. So there was tremendous, yeah, there was tremendous Jewish influence in those towns. And, you know, the truth of it is, is that, you know, actually they're worshiping the same God, right? I mean, they're worshiping the same God. So, Right. So, I mean, but they're worshiping the same God, you know? Right. Yeah. Right. You know, um, and if you ever talk to a Muslim or deal with a Muslim, you know, I mean, they, they believe in the same God as, as you do. They don't believe in a different God. I mean, all of them is... is uh, you know, however you want to pronounce the name of our God, but Yahweh, Yehovah, whatever, Jehovah, however you want to say it. Um, you know, it's the same God. Now, they don't believe in Jesus. They believe in Jesus. They just don't believe he was the son of God and that he had a sacrifice for us. Right. But, you know, essentially, whether you're talking about Islam, Judaism, or Christianity, I mean, we all, we all serve, we're all worshiping the same God, maybe in a different way, but, but it is the same God. So, uh, you know, it's a real intermingling of faith, isn't it? 
um, so to speak. So, not the same faith. No, I'm not saying it's the same faith. I'm just saying essentially, you know, it is the same God. And um, because like every, you know, whether you're talking about Islam, Judaism, or Christianity, they all trace themselves back to Abraham. It's just they don't go through Isaac, right, if you're Islam. But if you're Jews, Jews you do. Jews trace themselves through Isaac, right, through Jacob, through the 12 tribes. Um, Islam traces themselves through Ishmael. But, but they all, it's all Father Abraham. So, uh, you know, I think if you ever study with a, with a Muslim or somebody in Islam, you know, that's a common ground. You know, that's, that's a start to say, we do believe in the same God. You know, we believe, a, we have a different faith, we believe in a different way to worship Him, we believe differently, but we do essentially believe in the same God, you know. So, I mean, that's a big thing to have a faith in God. That's a good start, right, I think. So, uh, anyway, kind of interesting, but, so there, there's this intermingling here, and when he gets into Antioch, he says they're, they scattered them, the persecution he's talking about, the persecution of the Jews against the Christians, which basically started with Stephen in Acts 7. And he says, uh, made their way to Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except to Jews alone. See how Luke throws that in there? In other words, even though Peter's had this conversion at Cornelius, right, immediately Luke takes us into this scattering, the Jews scattering back, and he's saying, but they were only speaking to the Jews, Jews alone, right? Speaking the word to no one except to Jews alone. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began spending to the Greeks also, preaching the word of Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. The news about them reached the ears of the church of Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas off to Antioch. And when he arrived and witnessed the grace of God, he rejoiced and began to encourage them all with a resolute heart to remain true to the Lord, for he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and considerable numbers were brought to the Lord. And he left for Tarsus to look for Saul. So this is where we're going to bring Paul back in, right? We're going to bring him back in to this. Pull that Acts 10. Isn't there a thing on the end of there of Acts of that deal? I think there's a thing on the end of there we need to look at. Throw that back up there for a minute. Throw that Acts 10 back up there for a minute. Isn't there a deal on the end of there about Paul? Is that where I put that? I got you a deal on Paul. I think I put it there. Hold on. I'll find it. Maybe I'll find it. Maybe it's there. Because we got to kind of think, you know, time frame, where's Paul been? What's Paul been doing? Um, because if you look at what he says here in, in 11, um, it's interesting because he still, he still says Saul, doesn't he? He says he went to find Saul. Um, so he's going to go back. So Barnabas, no, I'll bring it next week. I thought it was there. I'll bring it next week. Anyway, I got you a deal on Paul on where he was, how long he was gone, where he went. It kind of helps fill in the blank because Paul gets converted in 9, right? Acts 9, gets converted to the road to Damascus, goes to Jerusalem, and basically it's to Jerusalem. They say, listen, you need to leave because they're going to kill you. So Paul goes back to Tarsus where he's going to stay for a while. This is, there's a period of time going on here. He's going to stay in Tarsus for a while. And then Barnabas who, if you remember right, Barnabas at the beginning was the one who kind of took Paul into Jerusalem, introduced him to everybody. He's the one that, you know, basically went from Damascus with him. So Barnabas knows him, right? And so all this is going on in Antioch. And so Barnabas, he, I don't know if God told him to do it. I don't know if Barnabas just decided, hey, I need to go get him. But Barnabas is going to go get, and, he, and it's interesting here because it says he's going to go get Saul, not Paul. So he's, we're still calling him Saul, right? He's going to go get Saul. He found him, he brought him to Antioch for an entire year. They met with the church, taught considerable numbers, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. So Antioch becomes the first Gentile church. Barnabas comes up from Jerusalem. You can't send anybody better than Barnabas. 
because Barnabas is the son of encouragement. Barnabas is always encouraging everybody. Barnabas is happy. He's rejoicing. Barnabas has passed this idea of Jew and Gentile. Barnabas is all in. And Barnabas says, I'm going to go get Saul. So he goes and gets Saul at Tarsus, which is, which is um, north, further north, around the end up there. He's going to go get uh, Saul and Tarsus. He's going to bring him back down to Antioch. And they're going to, and then they're going to, for a year, they're going to, they're going to stay in Antioch. They're going to teach a considerable number of them are, are there. They're going to call them Christians first at Antioch. So Antioch's going to become important. It's going to become important to Paul. At this time, some prophets came down, and one of the Agabus stood up, began to indicate by the Spirit there'd be a great famine. This is so pivotal in Paul's life. This particular little verse is so pivotal in Paul's life. Because if you read 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Paul was obsessed with getting money back to Jerusalem because of this famine. I mean, that was an obsession of his. A lot of scholars are like, why was it so important to him? You know, why was this like, if you really look at like Corinth, especially 2 Corinthians, you know, this, this famine in Jerusalem became an obsession. To get money and to get it back to Jerusalem became an obsession with Paul. And so there's been a lot of discussion about that. Why was it so important to him, you know? Why was it such a big deal to Paul to get money from Gentile churches back to Jerusalem? Huh? Because of the famine, but I think it was more than that. Yeah, yeah he wanted that relationship. He wanted the Jewish, I think he wanted the Jews in Jerusalem, the Jewish Christians, all right? Let's call them the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem. I think he wanted them to know that the Gentile churches cared about them. He wanted to establish a relationship. And I think Paul really thought in his mind, one way he could establish this relationship was by bringing a good deal of money from basically what we would call today Turkey, Asia Minor, back down to Jerusalem. Now, you know, we always talk about 1 Corinthians 16 too. We talk about giving, right? It says, lay by in store on the first day of the week. Worst verse ever about giving. Worst verse ever. We take that so out of context. Because all that was about getting money back to Jerusalem. He says, you know, lay by and store on the first day of the week so there'll be no collections when I come. That's the rest of that, right? So Paul, it's, it's a terrible verse for giving. I mean, I'm not saying we shouldn't give on the first day of the week, but that's always a verse people go to. Terrible example. Totally out of context. Paul wasn't saying lay by in the, on store on the first day of the week so that you can support yourselves in Corinth. Paul was saying lay by in the first day of the week and lay by in store so that when I come back, I can get that money and take it back to Jerusalem, right, for this famine. It becomes an obsession with him to get this money back. He wants to show those Jews in Jerusalem that the Gentiles love them. And he wants to try to make it a relationship thing. And it becomes, and I should, it really does. And it's something I didn't see for a long time. And I'd read, you know, I get so caught up in, in, in First and Second Corinthians with all the problems they have the church has in Corinthians. You get so caught up with that that sometimes you forget this theme all throughout there. Get money, take it to Jerusalem. Get money, take it to Jerusalem. Especially if you get in Second Corinthians, right? Get that money, going to send it with them, take it to Jerusalem. Paul wants it to be a, a good amount. He's giving them time to collect it, time to build it up. He wants it to be a show. And, and so that's, and this is where that starts, is with this idea that there's going to be a famine. There's going to be a great famine all over the world, and this took place during the reign of Claudius, and in the proportion that any of the disciples have means, each of them determined to send a contribution for the relief of the brethren living in Judea. Now, if you know that, Judea is just that little bitty section of ground around Jerusalem. We're not talking about a big land mass. Little section of land around Jerusalem. We're going to send it to Judea. And we're going to, uh, and, and this they did, sending it in charge of Barnabas and Saul to the elders. We're getting way ahead here, right? Getting way ahead here. Luke is showing, though, but here Luke puts the seed in. This is going to become a big part of Paul's ministry. So, as we get to the end of our time, Paul now, we see Paul coming in, and we see two really big things. One is, 
Barnabas goes and gets Saul and brings him to a Gentile church. Paul's going to be the apostle to the Gentiles, right? Paul's going to be the apostle to the Gentiles. So this starts, right? And Paul is going to embrace the Gentiles. And then the second thing is, Paul's going to have this overarching theme throughout his ministry, throughout the ministry we know of Paul, of getting this money and bringing it back to Judea because of this famine. So Luke's setting us up because all of a sudden, guess what? Paul's going to disappear, right? We're going to go back to Peter. Paul's going to disappear. And then we get, then we get to 13, right? At the end of 12, beginning of 13, then all of a sudden Paul comes on the scene. Peter's going to disappear. And the rest of the book Acts is going to be about Paul. But right now, Luke is introducing us to the two big themes of the life of the Apostle Paul. Gentiles and contribution to Jerusalem. So this, he's setting us up to move us into what's going to happen. And I'll bring that deal on Paul next week. Thanks for your time. We're out of time. <laughs> See you all next week. <laughs> <laughs>